The title of our little talk today is, uh, Is Doctrine Necessary? Um, everybody believes in something. Even if you believe in nothing, that's something. So doctrine seems to be a dirty word. We don't want to talk about doctrine. That's, that's legalistic and doctrine is something to be avoided. You know what doctrine means? Doctrine is teaching. That's what it means. What is the doctrine? What is the teaching? What is Christ teaching? And uh, there's two scriptures that come to mind, Matthew 28, 18 to 20, and last scriptures in Matthew telling the apostles to go and teach all nations the things I have told you. Teaching, doctrine. And then 2 John, 2 John 1, 9 and 10. Let me see if I can look at this up quick here. I got this big print Bible and sometimes that doesn't even work. 2 John 9 and 10. There's only one chapter in 2 John. Whosoever transgresses and does not abide in the doctrine of Christ does not have God. He who abides in the doctrine has both the Father and the Son. If anyone comes to you and does not bring this doctrine, do not receive him into your house nor greet him. So Christ thought doctrine was pretty important. John thought doctrine was pretty important. And doctrine is not a dirty word. Amen. Uh, So the question is, is what you believe important? I think it is important. Is what you teach your children important? Everybody would say, absolutely. What we teach them is right. So what God teaches us, is that important? Certainly. Would you teach your children something that is contrary to what you believe? That's called a hypocrite if you do that. Do as I, when we were growing up, do as I say, not as I do. Those days are over. People are always watching you, your kids especially. And if you think things get by your children, they don't. I mean, my kids are older now and they still tell me things. Remember when? They don't forget. Now we're talking 50 years ago, 40 years ago. They remember. So doctrine as defined in a dictionary is principle or position that is taught. So it's teaching a belief. So it would necessarily follow that there's truth doctrine and false doctrine. So why is sound doctrine important? Everybody says sound doctrine. We've got to have sound doctrine. What does that mean? Our faith is based on what we believe, on doctrine. Uh, the Bible is a sacred trust. We don't tamper with God's word. We have all sorts of Bibles out there. We've got this type of Bible and that type of Bible and Bible for this group and a Bible for that group that excludes certain scriptures to make them comfortable reading the Bible. Let's not make them uncomfortable. If you read the scriptures, you're gonna be uncomfortable if you have a conscience. Amen. You know, uh, the Bible is there for our cor correction and not to be mean to us, but because if we continue in the way we're going, bad things are gonna happen to us. Amen. So. <clears throat> the Bible is a sacred trust. We believe it affects, do you believe it affects how you live your life? What you believe? Certainly. Truth can be separated from fiction. In the end, sound doctrine is the doctrine of life. Unsound doctrine or false doctrine is the doctrine of death, eternal death. 1 Timothy, when Paul was writing to Timothy, Timothy was a young convert of Paul's, not a rah-rah guy like Paul. He was sort of uh, laid back, sort of uh, maybe not sure of himself, not bombastic like Paul. So he's writing to Timothy to encourage him, to explain to him the difficulties he might have. In 1 Timothy, 
110, it says, for fornicators, sodomites, kidnappers, liars, perjurers, and if there is any other thing that is contrary to sound doctrine, according to the glorious gospel of the blessed God, which was committed to my trust. Paul was given these tenets of the faith, what is right and what is wrong. We can't make right wrong and we can't make wrong right. It doesn't work that way. 1 Timothy 4.16 Take heed to yourself and to the doctrine. Continue in them, for in doing this, you will save both yourself and those that hear you. What you say has an impact on those people you say it to. And what you say has an impact on people who hear what you say. Maybe you don't think they hear, but they do hear, like when you say things in anger and people hear you and they say, hey, he goes to that church. Not a very good advertisement for the church. So we try to keep Christ in mind whenever we speak about anything. We'll be safe if we do that. 1 Timothy 6, 3 and 4. If anyone teaches otherwise and does not consent to wholesome words of our Lord Jesus Christ and the doctrine which is in according with godliness, he is proud knowing nothing, but is obsessed with disputes and arguments over words which come from envy, strive, reviling, evil suspicion. From such, withdraw yourself. Don't get in arguments with people unnecessarily. Stand up for the truth, stand up for the Lord, but don't be argumentative. It's never gonna win anything that way. You can be positive in your faith, but to argue with somebody, it takes two to argue, don't forget. If you don't argue, then there is no argument. What you believe does affect how you live. The virgin birth, Jesus is God. There is salvation through Christ and no other. When you die, you sleep. The seventh day Sabbath, God created the earth, not evolution. And the second coming, why are these things important? Why do we believe these things? Well, firstly, they're in this book. That's number one. God says they're true. Secondly, what you believe dictates how you run your life, just like a country. A country is, uh, you can tell what a country is by the laws it has. If the laws of that country reflect the people or at least the leadership's desire for that country. So the important thing on the state of the dead, very, very heavy implications on if you believe that you have an immortal soul that makes you as God because the Bible says God, only God has immortality. So it's extremely important to believe and to know what you believe. I remember when I was first uh, a Christian, uh, we have a prayer partner, it was Richie Nims, by the way. And Richie says to me, uh, Mike, don't ever be ashamed of what you believe. And when I was on the job, when you become from a police background where everybody pretty much is an atheist into a Christian background, you're looked at with kind of, you know, what happened to the guy? He used to be a good guy and now he's kind of weird, you know. Never be ashamed, and I never have been ashamed and never will be ashamed Amen. of what I believe, and neither should you, ever. So back home, we have a radio station, a small church, 100, 100 members. We have a radio station, we have a, a food pantry, we, have a, we used to have a sunshine band that we used to play and go around to the nursing homes. So why do we do that? Why do we have this stuff? To make us feel good? It does make you feel good to do good to others, but that's not the reason you do it. The reason you do it is because you have a doctrine of Christ that says, serve your fellow man, have him come first, love people, do what you can to help people. Doctrine is important, that's teaching, and that's what I was taught. 
And it makes you feel so much better when you do things like that. We had these people in the nursing home that the only people they ever saw to visit them was us. Nobody came, they had no family left. And we used to fill that place. Some of them were half asleep, but you could see their fingers, their fingers trying to keep track of the music and they would try to sing. And sometimes it sounded like feeding time in the zoo, but I'll tell you, it was really, really great. They were just great people. And when COVID came, of course, it, it put a kibosh on all of that and we have never gotten back at home to, to regenerate that, uh, the type of relationship we had. <clears throat> so the Ten Commandments, is that doctrine? Sure it is, it's teaching. What do we do with the Ten Commandments? Do we say, well, these are 10 suggestions. The Bible doesn't say it's 10 suggestions, it's a commandment. You obey commandments. Your life and what you believe will either make you close to God or drive you away from God, one or the other. I remember when I first learned about the Sabbath commandment. I used to tell my wife, I, I, I'd, I'd like to be a Christian, but boy, this Sabbath thing, I, I just can't do that. I'm, I work all the time. I need that day to, to catch up on all the things around the house and all of that. And since I kept the Sabbath when I was baptized, I have more time than I ever had and I get the same amount of work done. Amen. Funny how that happens, huh? And when you tithe, I have the same amount of money that I've always had, but it goes farther. Amen. And giving a lot, according to the world standard, to God's work. But he, he takes care of you. He will take care of you. Amazing how that works. I never thought that possible. Never, ever thought that possible. So God made a covenant with his people in the Old Testament and God made a covenant with his New Testament people. So why did he have to make another covenant, another doctrine, another teaching? Why was it necessary? Whose fault was it? It was our fault, right? It was our fault because they, let me go to uh, Hebrews 8, 6 and 10. Hebrews 8, 6 and 10. But now he has obtained a more excellent ministry inasmuch as he is also mediator of a better covenant which is established on better promises. For if that first covenant had been faultless, then no place would have been sought for a second. So if the first one was worked, there would be no change, but the first one didn't work. So because finding fault with them, not the covenant, but with them, them is who? The people. He says, Behold, the days are coming, says the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah. By the way, all God's covenant was made only with the house of Israel. I don't know if you're aware of that. God's covenant was, except for Noah. I stand corrected. Noah wasn't a Jew. Not according to the covenant that I made with their fathers in the day when I took them by the hand to lead them out of the land of Egypt but because they did not continue in my covenant and I disregarded them, says the Lord. For this covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, said the Lord, I will put my law in their minds and write them on their hearts and I will be their God and they shall be my people. When the doctrine or teaching is on your heart, it's much, much, much easier to obey. You agree? When it's in your heart, you don't have to look it up and say, well, let's see. Now I can do that. No, I can't do that. That's written down. Now I can't do that. It's in your heart. You know what is right and wrong. And you do that, do accordingly. I heard, uh, I can't remember the lady's name. She's on our radio station. She's not an Adventist. But she was giving a sermon once and she says, which I thought was profound, Death is the doorway to eternity. 
Isn't that amazing? Death is the doorway to eternity. That is true. We're not going to get there unless we die. You either die to the Lord or you die to yourself. All doctrines, doctrines in the Bible are for our understanding. When doctrine is ignored or considered unimportant, it's because we disagree with it. True? It's not convenient. I don't like to do that. I want to do what I want to do. So we'll get rid of that part. All doctrine, all doctrine. When someone opposes the word of God, it's false. Every, for every real, there's a counterfeit. We have false doctrine, we have true doctrine. Uh, false doctrine, for example. When I was growing up Catholic, we had things called indulgences. Anybody know what an indulgence is? That's when you pay money to get uh, a loved one shorten their time in purgatory uh, in order so that they might get to heaven. A funny thing, we used to do this all the time. You'd go over to the church as a group and you'd say a novena, which is a prayers to Mary, and you would get time off in purgatory while you're waiting to go to heaven. So you pay money. It never made any sense to me. But that's the problem with false doctrine. Now, if doctrine is you die and you sleep until the resurrection, which is what the Bible teaches, there's no need for this indulgences or any of the other stuff. It's just a shame that people use the word of God to enhance their own monetary gains and their own stature. I mean, the word of God stands on its own. And if we did more, while we're on the subject, Ukraine and Russia. What, what a shame. And let's make, let's tell it like it is here. There's bad on both sides here, you know. Yeah. There isn't one bad guy, there's two bad guys, and there's a whole bunch of bad people. And in the midst, there's a whole bunch of good people getting hurt. Yeah. The only one that can correct that situation is the Lord. If they listen to this book, and went by this book instead of the war annals, we'd be a lot better off. Your ego would be put out, your craziness would be put out. So why would anybody in their right mind not want to go by this book? Well, this is, this is, you can't go by this book, it doesn't give you freedom. You mean I, I won't have to lock my house when I go out? I won't have to worry about a drive-by shooting? I won't have to worry about a nuclear war? Sounds like good stuff to me. Sometimes I get carried away on this stuff. But <laughs> sorry about that. We're going to do a little experiment here. Suppose, suppose we said we don't need the Bible. We don't need this. That'd be like saying, okay, we're going to take all the traffic signs out of every road in this area. No more traffic lights, no more traffic signs because we don't want to be bothered with people telling us what to do. I know there's a big turn, there's a 90 degree turn there and if you take it too fast there's going to be problems. But we're going to take the warning signs down because that makes people feel uncomfortable. What do you think would happen? You think there'd be chaos? You think there'd be death? You think there'd be absolute... It's just craziness. So those signs are there for what reason? To warn us that if you do this, there's going to be consequences that you're not going to be able to correct. These consequences are going to be permanent. If you kill somebody, that's permanent. The Bible is the same way. That's why we have doctrine, to give us warning that these things are not good for you. I have things, the Lord says, that are good for you. Listen to me. I care for you more than your neighbor does, more than your parents do. And if you understand that, you will have no problem in following this book. So what are the attributes of this God of creation, the one who wrote this book? What is, what are the, what is his attributes? Why, why do we look up to this God? First of all, God does not change. He has always been and he always will be. 
There never was a time when he was not. There never will become a time when he will cease to be. God has neither evolved, grown, nor improved. All that he is today, he has ever been and ever will be. He never changes because he is God. He is the same yesterday, today, and forever. God's character does not change. Whatever the attributes of God were before the universe was called into existence, they are the same now and will be forever. His love is forever. God's unchanging character sets him apart from everyone and everything. Everyone and everything in the universe changes, but not God. God's truth does not change. God's word does not change because it is the truth. God's word stands forever. God's truth never changes because God never changes. It is perfect just as he is perfect. It needs no additions or corrections. It remains the same. God's ways do not change. He loves the whole world. He warns them. He makes a way of salvation for them as for all of us by giving, giving his son. By the way, you hear everybody quote John 3, 16. You know, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that everybody through him will have eternal life. But they forget John 17. And John 17 says, for God did not bring Christ into the world to condemn the world, but through him that the world might be saved. That is the purpose, to save us. Not to give us a bad time, not to deny us things, but to save us. He gives us free choice. Since he cannot lie, he is true to his promises. If God says something, it either did happen, is happening, or will happen. No doubt about it. This is the faithful, unchanging God you can trust completely for today, tomorrow, and forever. That's why we believe this book. Sound doctrine is built on the word of God. Sound doctrine magnifies the holiness of God. Sound doctrine declares the depravity of man. If you doubt that, look at our world. Is man depraved? Amen. If, you, if you're left to your own conscience in your own dictates without ever having read this book or knowing about God, where do you think we'd all be today? We'd be shooting each other like those people in Iran are, or Ukraine. Following sound doctrine leads to eternal life and a true loving relationship with our Creator. You know, beginning a relationship with the Lord does not take much knowledge. It takes basics. God loves you. He sent his son to die for you. He did for you what you cannot do for yourself. And he gives you what he, deserve, what he, what he deserves, he gives you so you may enjoy that life. Dynamic truth for building a dynamic relationship. The purpose of doctrine is to teach us about the heart, nature, and character of God. Scriptural unity is based upon sound doctrine building the foundation on the word of God. If someone's doctrine contradicts the scripture, they are not of God, regardless of their works, ministry, or any other method. You see wonderful people doing great things. Why do they do great things? Is it for them? Is it so they can look good? Some do. Look at me. Aren't I great? I'm worth $67 billion and I give a million to this. That's like nothing. Nothing to these people. The doctrine of the word of God is the sole standard of measure we are given. That's what we go by. The word of God. That's the doctrine. There's a large church in Texas and the preacher there was giving a sermon on why do we don't have to be afraid of death? And this preacher, if I mention his name, you'd all know, but I won't. All I can think of is a lot of teeth. 
a lot of smile, a lot of teeth. Anyway, he's talking about how you never have to be afraid of death. And he goes on, and, and towards the end of the sermon, which is usually when the pastors and speakers make their point, and he says, you never have to be afraid of death because there is no death. Really? It must be that God didn't know what he was talking about when he says, you shall surely die. That's why doctrine and teaching the right things and understanding what this, this book says is extremely important. You do die. You do go to sleep. You do cease to exist. Your body goes to the dust and your breath returns to God as he gave it. That's what the Bible says and that's what I believe. Nice, warm, fuzzy message, but it's not true. Who of us that are parents would not instruct our children as to right and wrong? Who would say, go ahead and make your own decisions without an opportunity to know life's truth? If your son says to you, little four-year-old says, I'm going to go to kindergarten today, Dad, or whatever. He says, okay, what would you like for breakfast? I'd like some sugar pops, and I'd like some maple syrup on there, and then I'd like some chocolate syrup, some caramel syrup. And what parent's going to say, yeah, have for yourself. How about a double portion of that? Sounds really good to me. Why don't you do that? Because you know more than that child, isn't that right? Do you know more than that child? Yeah. So you're going to say, I'm sorry, you've got to have a healthy breakfast so you could make it, you know, to the afternoon without climbing the walls with the teacher. So it's necessary we pay attention to people that know more than we do. So what should we do? Keep the faith. Keep the faith for someday all the worries and problems of this life will be gone and we'll have the privilege of spending eternity with our Savior. It is our choice to choose Him. It's always your choice. As long as you have breath, you have a choice. Once you cease to breathe, the choice you made will stick with you for eternity. It has been said that when you fall asleep for the last time, there are only two things that are important. Who you've loved and who's loved you. Amen. The Bible teaches that God has loved us since before we were in the womb. The only remaining question is, do we love him enough to choose him and his teachings? Is the teaching of the Lord important or doesn't it really matter what you believe? The Lord Jesus Christ is either nothing, something, or everything. If his teachings do not matter, then he is nothing. If he is a good man, like some say, and doctrines do not, are, are not important, then take the teachings that you like and say that he is something. But if you love him, he is everything. For everything that he ever said and everything that he ever did will affect every moment of your life. For he taught that he will come again. I have prepared a place for you, is what he said. Welcome, my good and faithful servant, will be his salutation to him, to you. Eyes have not seen, nor ear heard, nor into the hearts of men the things that the Lord has prepared for those who love him. Yes, he is everything. Father in heaven, we thank you for the privilege of having you as our God. We thank you for the privilege of your word and that you look out for us always. Now as we go from this place, we ask a blessing upon us and the people of this world that they may come to know you better. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.